Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to not just another Kerbal Space Program video, but a new Kerbal Space Program series entitled Life on Lathe. This is like my attempt at a new series format. Obviously, I've done a few different series in the past. For example, Land Aerospace was just a career mode playthrough, basically, or a science mode playthrough, I should say. Then we had, obviously, Green Harvest and Expedition Eve being like cinematic films, and then Juno Attacks being like this weird combination of the two where it's all like voice acted, quote unquote, <laughs> with a plot and story like Green Harvest and Expedition Eve, but clearly being played by someone because the UI was visible as was the cursor. It was kind of meant to represent what a hypothetical story mode for KSP might look like. Well, this is kind of the same sort of thing as Juno Attacks. So obviously, it's a commentary by me, but there's going to be some little RPG elements to it, like role-playing elements to it, and there's going to be an overarching plot. It's a little thing I'm trying out. Let me know what you think of it. In this episode, this is like the first episode, we're going to be sending a giant space station to low Lathe orbits to perform some initial analysis and an analysis analysis, <laughs> uh, and then we can like base future missions based on what this station works out. There's a lot of modules to this station, as you may have seen, with various different contraptions built in, which may or may not come into play in later episodes down the line. You'll have to just wait and see. So obviously no craft files until the series is over, I'm afraid. But hopefully you guys will be alright. I mean, why not even put craft files out? I feel like I feel like I always feel like space stations are much more fun to build yourself rather than using a craft file. So maybe not necessarily the big space sh space station, but other things I may well end up putting craft files too. We'll have to kind of see how we go, really. <laughs> but yes, I guess I should say, you know, hope you enjoy the rest of this series. It's uh, it's gonna be it's uh, it's gonna be a few episodes long. I did put a poll out on Twitter which celestial body people we've been most interested in. Would it be, you know, Take on Tylo, Destination Juna, or Life on Lathe? You can tell I like alliteration, or adore alliteration, I should say. And the overwhelming majority of people voted for Lathe. And I'm kind of glad, because Lathe is probably the most mysterious planet, or moon, I should say, probably the most mysterious celestial body in the entire Kerbin system, except for maybe Jewel itself, I guess. Because, like, much like in the real world, gas giants are still quite, you know, there's a lot of mysteries around them. But aside from Jewel, and I guess possibly Eve, now we're, we're going to get sidetracked here, <laughs> um, Lathe is very, very, very interesting. Because, you know, you might think, oh, yeah, we know a lot about Lathe, right? It's the, it's the innermost of the five natural satellites of Jewel, mostly covered in seas. It has lots of rocky, sandy islands entirely locked to Jewel. Um, you know, the sphere of influence is too small for synchronous orbit, so we can't unfortunately put a geostationary relay network around it in this series. But, you know, when you think about it, Leif doesn't really make much sense. For starters, you know, unlike pretty much every other planet and moon in this game, it has no real-life counterparts. Because it doesn't, it shouldn't be able to exist the way it does. For those that really don't know anything about Lathe, it first of all has an oxygenated atmosphere. So jet engines work there, kerbals can breathe there. It's all very, you know, hospitable in terms of habitation uh, ability, habitation like habitation potential. Uh, for example, like, so basically a lot of people will disagree with me and say, no, there is a real life variant to uh, Lathe, and that is, of course, uh, Saturn's moon Titan. And I guess you are correct in a way. Titan, first of all, is the only known moon to have a dense atmosphere in the real world, that is, or, you know, in, that's actually been observed in real outer space. And it's the only place other than Earth, obviously, that's been observed to have stable bodies of liquid on the surface. But that's just it. Say I say stable bodies of liquid and not stable bodies of water because Obviously, out at Titan, it's much, much, much too cold to sustain liquid water. So instead, it's usually like big lakes of methane rather than lakes of water, which would obviously be just be massive blocks of ice <laughs> that far out. The same is true for Lathe. How is it that Lathe can not only sustain, sustain liquid water on its surface, but it also can have an oxygenated atmosphere, not some horrible cocktail of noxious gases that uh, a real-life version of it would probably have? This 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 definitely warrants some investigation, and that is what I intend to achieve this series, is work out why exactly Laith is the way it do be is. <laughs> now, this is not to say that there is currently no hypothesis as to why Laith is the way it is. So, so although Laith has liquid water on its surface, its polar regions have temperatures below zero degrees Celsius, even beyond the ice caps themselves, which means that Laith's oceans must contain another compound which reduces its freezing point, which is most likely ionic, such as salt. I'm quoting the KSP Wikipedia here because I'm figuring that more clever people than me have already researched this in great depth. 
They haven't done the practical experiments that I'm going to be doing in this series, though. You see, surface samples indicate that much salt is present on Lathe's surface, and like that of Kerbin, the air can be breathed by Kerbals, um, according to the EVA reports from 1.6 onwards, but they note that the air has a strange smell about it. Therefore, that there is possibly also high concentrations of salt in the air, as well as on the surface, assuming that the salt is sodium chloride. That's the current theory. But I don't know. I think we need to question. We need to question everything. Flat Earth is real, guy. <laughs> we should question everything we hear. We need to do some practical experiments and figure this, figure this out for ourselves. Which, of course, necessitates launching a gigantic space station to a low lathe orbit, which, as you can see, we are launching now. The original plan was to send this up in multiple launches, dock it all together in low Kerbin orbit, and then ship the whole thing off to Lathe and well, the dual system. Well, so Lathe, yeah. <laughs> uh, but I thought it'd be a bit too time consuming. As you can see, this video is already 25 minutes long. This is not the only space station we're going to be sending in this series. I didn't want too many episodes to just be meandering about with space stations for very, very long periods of time. So I thought, let's just try and get this one done relatively efficiently and just make a gigantic rocket that can send the whole thing up in one big go. This is that rocket here, so fairly slender. I didn't want to make it too kind of stumpy and wide. I wanted to make it look a little bit like a real rocket, just, you know, massively upscaled. Uh, so we've got a little cluster of mammoth engines towards the bottom built around the Saturn V parts from the Mark, the Making History expansion pack. It's a fairly standard gravity turn, albeit a much less aggressive one than what I might necessarily normally do. Ordinarily, I aim to be pointing about 45 degrees by the time I reach 10 kilometers. However, because this thing is so, first of all, unwieldy and difficult to control, and also because it's so aerodynamically uh, unstable, I decided to go for a slightly, um, slightly more lenient or you know, conservative gravity turn, and I ended up aiming for 45 degrees by about the 15, 16 kilometer mark, just to make sure that we were not tipping over too quickly in the thicker parts of the atmosphere where flipping over is um, the most likely to is most likely you're most likely to flip over at those parts in the atmosphere but so uh, you know we've expended the first stage now pretty much so we can get ready to fire up the second stage there was a slight error actually with the second stage when i designed this craft i added like a probe core and reaction wheels and batteries to this stage just here just so that when we uh, circularize we wouldn't just leave the debris in orbit we could then deorbit it and possibly even land it on the surface of Kerbin. However, I then I finished making the ship, saved it, and then went to bed and came back the next day to actually fly the mission. And I stupidly launched the auto-saved ship rather than the one I'd actually physically manually saved, I guess because I just assumed that the auto-saved ship would just be either one that was auto-saved or it would just be the ship that you last saved yourself. Evidently not the case, as when I opened it, a lot of the action groups were missing. So throughout this mission, I'd have to do a couple of the actions manually rather than just using you know, the actions I set. And also this thing was without uh, means of landing the second stage. So whoops, not a big deal. So we will be ditching this stage just before we reach a completely stable orbit, just so that it will end up deorbiting itself through the atmosphere, or that it will be crashing spectacularly into the surface rather than landing gracefully. But there is the 60 kilometer mark, which puts us well on the way to space, which of course starts at 70 kilometers. Uh, unlike Earth, it's a very, very sudden transition between atmosphere and space. And there we are. We are now in space. We can get that fairing deployed and get a good look at this thing. I know you guys have already seen it because I, you saw the whole thing get built, but it's sometimes it's nice to see it in the flesh in space. A flesh is probably the wrong word because it's a, it's, a, it's a synthetic object. And I guess it's all on a screen and not a tangible, like, physical thing anyway. So I don't really know what I'm trying to get at there. I hope I hope you kind of get the sentiment, though. <laughs> so we can get ready to circularize. We're going to do a lot of the circularization using the remaining fuel of that second stage. But then we're going to switch over to our interplanetary stage for the rest of the burn, which, as you can see, is not using nuclear engines, as is usually tradition for these long distance flights, just because... I didn't want to have to faff around with low thrust to weight ratio. You've seen how big this craft is, right? The dry mass is enormous. I just got done with a really, really poor thrust to weight ratio craft. My SSTI I did a couple of weeks ago. I kind of just wanted an easy craft. So it's got enough delta V so we can get to Lathe without any to faff around with lots of gravity assists on the way. We're just going to do a big burn at Kerbin. Just the one burn as well. None of this multiple burns at periapsis nonsense. And then we're going to just get to Lathe and immediately circularize at Lathe. No gravity assists from Tylo to get our circularization at Jewel done for a little bit cheaper. We just added some more boosters and more fuel. Because this isn't a single stage craft, I didn't need to be too worried about, you know, getting the most precise <laughs> efficiency and all that. We could just keep on adding boosters till it works. Yeah? The the old it's the Kerbal way, guys. It's the Kerbal way. 
And then we are initiating our escape burn now. I wanted to make sure things were running stable before I initiated some physics warps. We get the burn well underway. And there is our apoapsis soaring up now. So it's always quite a slow process at first. And it gets exponentially faster and faster as we reach the edge of Kerbin's sphere of influence. And then we can just zoom out on the map screen and watch our apoapsis raise its way all the way to Jewel. So yeah, that's like another benefit of having the big thrust weight ratio engine is that you can just do that one very relatively quick burn to get ourselves all the way up without, you know, as I said earlier, needing to do multiple burns at periapsis. We can get the whole thing done, still relatively close to periapsis, so we're maximising our rebirth effect usage, but not to the point where we have to do lots and lots of burns in order to get some a reasonable level of efficiency. So we just need to do a quick normal burn on the way there, because our inclination isn't quite right, but as you can see it's a relatively cheap burn, at least compared to the burn we just did, and the burn we'll need to do to get ourselves circularized because this thing can't error break to get captured at length. I mean, I guess it could because we have a, a heat shield at the very front of it. I mean, I'm talking about it now, but you can't actually see it. But when you see it, again, you'll see the heat shield at the front. That is actually attached to the uh, Kerbin return module, so I didn't want to use the heat shield for capturing at length because... Uh, I feel from a realism standpoint we shouldn't be just relying on the same heat shield more than once for the sake of safety and realism, which I guess falls under the umbrella of safety. Uh, and also because of the fact that you can't deflate the heat shields and given that that thing is going to be attached to the station, at least for the rest of the series for now, uh, is my current plan, I, it might look a bit ugly. So I thought, let's just leave the heat shield. So we're going to do our capture burn at lathe. We don't actually have enough delta V to get our entire orbit uh, circularized at lathe. I mean, we can get captured using engine burn, but we don't have enough fueling fuel to get ourselves on a symmetrically circular orbit. So we will have to do some minor air braking, aero braking to get our apoapsis down to a desirable height, but we'll be going much slower at this point, so it's much, much safer. That being said, the equipment on here is still quite fragile, so we do have to be fairly conservative with our periapsis height, but so, so I guess ultimately it's still not a very realistic <laughs> um, mission plan. But regardless, it's a little bit more realistic than the other, than the alternative. So there is our dual orbit encounter pretty much done. There's some minor tweaking here and there because the maneuver node maker in the game is not quite as accurate as you might want it to be. I think I also overshot <laughs> the maneuver node by a bit, which probably didn't help matters either. We should do a quick time warp up to this to this maneuver node just to get our lathe encounter all finalized. I say finalized, we'll need to do one final minor correction just as we approach dual, but for the most part it's done. And then we can just focus in on lathe, get our parapsis nice and low. I thought about correcting this little orbit later on because as you can see, we're not quite going to be equatorial when we circularize. And I thought about doing a correction so that we would be perfectly equatorial. But then I thought, to be honest, it's probably better to not be equatorial. In fact, I probably should have done an even more slanted orbit than what we ultimately ended up with just here. Just because we're effectively covering more of the surface, if that makes sense. Like the space station, we're passing over more of the surface of lathe, if that makes sense. Like you can be a Kerbal on the surface and you're not necessarily directly underneath the station. But if you just wait, eventually lathe will rotate to the point where you now are directly under the station. If that makes sense. I feel like once you see it in come into practical use, it will make more sense. But you know, we'll just be covering more of the surface of lathe with a plan like this. I mean, ultimately, it doesn't take that much fuel to get off lathe. And so it's, it's not really a problem anyway. But I thought, yeah, just for the sake of ease, <laughs> ease of use, if nothing else, it'll be all right. So as you can see, using the... Uh, Using the new feature where the maneuver node maker actually tells you if you're going to run out of fuel or not. You can see we would indeed run out of fuel. So I'm just going to do our first capture with the engine. And then we're going to arrange ourselves in such a way that we can do some atmospheric braking to get ourselves the rest of the way slowed down. But as established, we're going to have to be fairly conservative with our periapsis height. Because look at all those fragile solar panels, scientific pieces of equipment, and of course batteries sticking out of this thing that are very susceptible to heating. So we're going to go for just, I went with 47 kilometers above the surface of the moon. I definitely didn't figure this out the hard way in terms of what would be a good height to go with. Uh, and then we can just do five air brake passes at relatively high altitude, um, just to get ourselves slowed down. For those that don't know, late atmosphere ends at 50 kilometers. So we're only going to be dipping around three, between three and five kilometers into its surf, into its atmosphere for every single air brake that we do. But as you're about to find out, that end that still wouldn't have been quite close to the uh, the maximum that this thing can really tolerate. Because as I said, it's not really designed to be hitting atmospheres at great speed. It is, at the end of the day, a space station, so it's not really built for it. So I went with the engine stage as the bit that took the brunt of the heating, because engines are quite heat tolerant in this game, at least relative to other parts. Uh, I did forget that I'd put batteries around the engine nozzle, which are relatively less tolerant of heating, but even so, you can see those solar panels 
towards the middle of the craft are getting very, very hot. And there's a lot more solar panels at the other end of the craft compared to the back. So I thought I'd rather not risk breaking those solar panels. Um, I'm happy to just risk the batteries because we don't really need those batteries anymore anyway. They're just part of the transfer stage. I'm keeping the transfer stage as is for the moment, at least for the end of this episode, because it is forming the backbone of this ship. But as we begin to reconfigure it and put all the modules in the places they need to go, we'll end up ditching the transfer stage and plummeting it into uh, the surface of Leith to be destroyed. Or, you know, maybe we'll come up with some other creative use for it. Depending on what situations arise, we may need to call upon such a piece of equipment. I don't I don't know. I don't really know. <laughs> As you can tell, a lot of planning has gone. As you know, to be fair, I have done quite a bit of planning. I've done about uh, two, five minutes of planning today, for example, of, of what's going to happen in this series. But if you do have any ideas for mission profiles you would like to see, do let me know. I'm, not probably, I'm probably not going to take any plot points or anything from my Discord server or the comment section, just because... Uh, I don't really want it to end. I don't really want the plot to be based upon YouTube comments because then it's going to be like a spoiler for people that read the comments. If that makes sense. I want it to be kind of a surprise as things go along, really. But I mean, you're welcome to suggest things just in case. But there we go. We've done our initial air breaks. Um, as you can see, we're losing a lot of height from our apoapsis. But with each subsequent air break, as you're probably aware, it's like an exponentially decreasing thing. So with each subsequent air break, we're going to be uh, our apoapsis is going to be decreasing in height to a lesser and lesser extent because you're going to need more and more delta v to get yourself closer towards the surface of the planet. At least when it comes to decreasing your orbit, it's kind of the other way around when you're increasing your orbit. So yeah, doing our next air break. As you can see, we couldn't really do a more aggressive air break to force our apoapsis down at a faster rate because those temperature gauges are still creeping up to dangerously toasty levels on those batteries. I think for the sake of argument, we can say those batteries have probably seized up and are useless at this point, given the amount of heat they've just had whacked against them. But as I mentioned, they're mainly there to serve the transfer stage. They're not really required for the rest of the space station. So, yep, we've got a nice uh, orbital height there. If we did another air break, we'd probably bring our apoapsis too low down and put ourselves in an unstable orbit and end up crashing into the ocean or land, I suppose. But I think with Lathe, you're far more likely to hit the water than you are the land. So we can just do the rest of the circularization with the engine because it's not like we were at bingo fuel. We do still have some fuel left in us to do the final bits of circularization. So I went for an orbit of 70 kilometers. Late atmosphere is 50 kilometers, but 70 kilometers is a nice sort of safe altitude above the Kármán line. I think people get annoyed when I say Kármán line, we're not specifically referring to Earth. But for those who don't know, the Kármán line is the point at which Earth's atmosphere ends and space begins. Like, unlike in this game, uh, Earth's atmosphere doesn't just like end and then you're in instantly in space. It kind of fades off gradually. But the Kármán line is the point at which it's decided that you are now no longer in the Earth's atmosphere, but you are now in the vacuum of space. And I kind of use that to describe the, the atmospheric borders of all the planets in this game as well, even though it's not technically correct, as is the way when I say geostationary. Again, geostationary refers specifically to Earth. But, you know, I feel like... Come on, guys. You, know, you guys know what I mean when I say it. So, we're going to start reconfiguring this station into the places we want to put it. So, first things first, I'm putting the observatory module on like this, although I will be pretty much immediately undocking it for reasons that you're about to find out. Um, but we'll, I won't spoil it. So, yeah, kind of a painful process getting things docked in this game. Sometimes the magnets don't always get things suckered on first time, but there we are. We're all attached. And then we can detach the lab module and get that reconfigured. And at this point I realised that whilst I'd put monopellant tanks and probe cores on the lab, I had forgotten to put monopellant thrusters. I like to think I might have actually done it, but then it was the problem with the auto-saved ship glitching out again, but I doubt it. I think I just completely somehow forgot that I would need to put monopellant thrusters on this module. So I did what anyone would do and just docked the space station to the module rather than the other way around. So I kind of kicked it into like a big, a better orientation using those guidance sort of spines on the transfer stage, spun ourselves around and got other the docking ports roughly aligned. Uh, I, luckily, like I said, there is a probe core in here, so we do have SAS control on this thing at the very least. It wasn't a, it wasn't an overly painful process. We can get ourselves pointing towards the docking port we need to align ourselves to, and then it's just going to be a case of slowly dropping this thing down and getting onto that docking port. So there were some orientation issues, but luckily the docking ports do have magnets on them, so we can do a little bit of adjustment using kind of the mag. Well, the magnetic forces can do the final bit of the docking and bring the pieces into the correct alignment. It was just like, oh, maybe, maybe, maybe. I would put the interstellar music on here, but I don't want to get a copyright strike like last time. So we're going to just quickly... I'm playing it back at relatively fast speed, but there we go, we did it. So now we can get ourselves spun into the position we wanted to put the observatory module back on. 
little bit of a wobbly rotation, but it's no biggie, it's no biggie. This thing has obviously now drifted a little bit far away from where it was, so I had to quickly get ourselves sent back. Luckily, I, lo I always like adding a little bit more monopolant than I really need. For cases like this, where I turn out to be an idiot about the design and forget to add something. So it's just as well, really. So again, oh, I accidentally left the auto SAS on for a second. Yep, just getting it lined up. And then this is probably going to be the bulk of all the reconfiguration we're going to do in this episode. This station is f modular, like, even further than what we're doing in this episode. But for the most part, this is going to be its initial phase. We're going to have all of the bits added on like this. And then as each situation arises, we're going to detach or reconfigure or otherwise use parts of the space station for various other things. You can probably tell if you watch the time lapse, you can probably figure out what each bit is supposed to do. But for the most part, we're going to keep it just the way it is. So we can do a little fade across to a nice cinematic view so we can deploy the radiators and solar panels and see this thing in its its full glory. And as you can see, it's pretty massive. I feel like this is probably the biggest space station I've ever built, uh, at least as far out as Jewel. I mean, I guess I have built bigger ones in Green Harvest and Junior Attacks, but those I always consider to be a little bit different, even though this series is part of the canon of those games, those, those series, I guess, whatever, regardless. There we go. So obviously, that's the first phase of this mission, is to build this space station. Obviously, the other objective I want to achieve was get Valentina back. So we're going to get one of the Kerbals on this ship ready to take her place on the existing jewel station. And then we can cut to the jewel station in just a second and get Valentina on the way. I'm not going to show that in very kind of thorough depth. We can just skip ahead through certain bits, but I'll show you some highlights. So we can fade across now. This is the jewel station here. So Man, I really love the way this thing came out. I really, I still really love the aesthetics of it. I still think it's probably one of the best, if not the best looking space station I've built, if I do say so myself. But, you know, that's a very subjective thing, I guess. So there we are. So we've got an ion ship there. Not very much fuel, isn't it? It's only got one tank, but don't forget that ion engines are very, very, very efficient. There's more, it's more limited by its batteries than it is with the ion engine. So I had to do a lot of kind of burns in stages because it can only really do like 300 meters per second burns at any one point before it runs out of electric charge but it wasn't really a problem because we're just doing orbits to orbit so we don't need to have like the ability to do uh, engine burns for longer than that so it's fine so yeah playing this back at very very high speed just getting ourselves on a nice lathe encounter as you can see i am doing multiple burns here to make sure we get ourselves on an encounter but as i said it's not a problem it's not a problem and as you can see valentina is very happy and very excited to be part of this historic mission to analyze late. You'd think the Kerbals would have done it sooner. How old are the Kerbals in my save? Probably like over a thousand years old at this point. But, you know, better late than never. Better late than never is what I like to say. So there we go. Getting our lathe apparatus down. I didn't want to risk air braking in this thing. So I just did the whole thing using engines. Get ourselves a nice encounter with the space station. Which, as you can see, it's not too tricky. Just keep on using the skip orbit button, if nothing else. Because lathe's quite small, it doesn't take very long. And there we are, the jewel, this, I actually come up with a name for this thing actually, I guess the lathe orbiter, for one of a better term. So obviously the lathe orbiter itself has no, well I guess not obviously, but the lathe orbiting station doesn't have any junior docking ports, so we can't directly dock Valentina's ship to it, so we're going to have to do a quick EVA walk to get out, and then we're going to put our new, her replacement on the ship she just came on, and then they can go back to the jewel station to continue, I don't know, whatever it was they were doing on the jewel station. They've been there for quite a few years. They've probably finished their mission at this point, but Kerbals love space. Kerbals love space. So, yeah, there goes the lathe orbiter. We'll come back to that in just a second when we uh, come to wrapping this video up, but we don't need to spend too long on the trip back to the jewel station. You can just see there, that's what happens when we run out of electric charge. The engines lose all their thrust, and we only really have one running properly at any one point. So, yeah, we're going to do multiple burns at periopsis this time, but... Yeah, it's not that interesting. We'll skip ahead. We'll skip ahead to our... It took us a little while to get back to the jewel station because I didn't really wait for a good transfer window, so I probably could have done this in a little bit quick, in a, a bit of a quicker amount of time, but it was fine. Gave us lots of, lots of opportunities to perform some initial scans of lathe before we get our uh, additional missions underway. And don't forget, if this is taking place in the same timeline as Green Harvest, the Kerbals have Krakenite, which means that time warping is a thing for them. So really, it's like basically no time has elapsed for them at this point, so it's fine. Don't worry about it. So yeah, this thing has no monopolent thrusters on it, but it's very easy to get docked on without them, so it's okay. We can just skip ahead to our actual contact point. And I guess that pretty much comes to, like, bring brings this video towards its conclusion. So let me know what you think of this format. Like I said, I know it's probably going to be hard to judge this series' format just yet because 
nothing has really happened so far that differentiates this from a normal video that I do. But maybe you know, at least from the concept, it might sound interesting. Maybe you guys think the concept sounds awful and I'll abandon it. But I hope not. I hope that you might see the potential that I see. I don't know if it's actually going to work. It could suck. There's a pretty good chance it will. Let's face it, I'm making the video. But hopefully there is a slim chance it could be somewhat entertaining. I guess we'll have to wait and see, but we can end with this little shot of the space station floating majestically over the surface of Leith. Uh, like I said, hope you enjoyed this episode. If there's more episodes out, there'll be links on screen to them now. Otherwise, there are just links to other videos, as well as obviously to subscribe and a link to my Patreon, as well as an indication for the Discord and Twitter links which are in the description, as well as my merch. All of that good stuff. I uh, hope you enjoyed this video, guys. I hope you enjoy the rest of your weekend and life the rest of your life let's let's end on that <laughs>